Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. And how are we today? OK. So I'm speaking uh, to a group of legal professionals, not being a legal professional myself, least qualified in that sense. Am I? So I'm going to tell you a story today. It's um, a story of someone with, with privilege. In the very beginning of time, I was born into a well-to-do family, raised with the best of education, exposure, exposure to arts and sports. And I grew up with the aspirations that many, many upper middle class people have to do well in life, um, to have a professional career, and to climb the ladder of that professional career. And that journey took me to becoming a goddess. And the reason I call myself a goddess is because, you know, I could balance all of this. I had a home. I had a fabulous job. I was working in a hotshot technical company, running their partnering business for Asia Pacific. And, you know, I had my avocations. And I, like every goddess, I could give out three boons, right? In, in, the, in that avatar, right, I could give out three boons. One boon was every birthday party, you make sure that you do some charity, you donate like many people do, yes? The other boon is you make sure that the, the lesser privileged people around you, the watchman's family, the household helps family, they're educated, you sponsor their education. We all do it, right? That's the second boon. That's the way we assuage our conscience, right? So this is the sort of thing that I was doing. And the reason I call myself a goddess is the same reason that each and every one of you in this room is a god or a goddess. Most of India earns less than 10,000 a month, less than 5,000 a month, and here we are. What this does to us in our goddess avatar is that when you earn so much more than the rest of the population, <clears throat> and you're able to give out these boons selectively, is that like any god or goddess, you're in your stratosphere. You don't breathe that polluted, dirty Delhi air. You're in your own stratosphere, in your air-conditioned car. You're out of touch, out of reach, like every god or goddess. At least that's what the common people think. They don't know how you live. They don't know what you do. Because the kind of things you do, other people can't aspire to do. It may seem ordinary to you because there's enough of us. But the fact is it's completely disconnected from people's daily realities. So my days proceeded. While a friend of mine who was sitting in the audience, Srinivas Alavilli, came to me and said, you know, I'm going to start a liberal reform party in Karnataka based on something that existed in Andhra Pradesh. Will you participate in that journey? Will you be one of the people that contributes to that? Work with me on that. And even as he was framing the words of that sentence, my mind is going here. I'm thinking politics, right? He's saying reform liberal, and this is the picture that comes to my mind. And I'm thinking dirty politics. I'm not thinking reform and liberal, right? Because that's the usual epithet that goes with politics. But I start working on this. And like a true businesswoman, like a true techie, problem solving, my next thought is, OK, I can't turn this guy down. So what's the next best thing that I can do? I can, ayo, I can negotiate, right? I want to negotiate myself into a position of leverage. I want to say, OK, I'll help you. But here's the deal. I will dip my toes in that dirty water, but that's as far as I will go. I want to remain anonymous. My face should never be seen. If there's 20 people in the protest, I'll be the 21st person at the back, right? I will help you write something, but my name should never appear in print. I will help you take notes. I want to be a fly on the wall. I will help you from the back, right? So you kind of start moving from being this goddess who's focused on I, me, myself into little bit of a very reluctant, tentative citizen. But the process of doing this, soon an election campaign began. And I was introduced to the candidate <clears throat> for whom we were running the campaign. It was the MLC elections in Karnataka, the upper house. And the candidate was a really inspiring gentleman called Dr. Ash Ashwin Mahesh, a NASA scientist who had a doctorate in geophysics, who was working in the US, returned here, and started not only as a social entrepreneur, but as a public problem solver. 
He was so inspiring that I slowly got drawn into his campaign. And I thought, if he can do so much, can I not do a little bit more to help him? And in this process of being the fly on the wall, I started, you know, working at the back end with, you know, the conferences they need to put together and the positions the party needs to take. You know, Pericles said during the Athenian democracy that you can ignore politics, but politics won't ignore you. And the thing about being, you know, whether you have a street light on or off, whether you get water in a tanker or it flows through your pipes, everything is politics. And the thing about being in a political party is that you have to respond to all this. If there is a bus accident, you have to respond to it. If there is a strike where the sanitation workers are not being paid, you may be a tiny little party in the corner that no one knows exists, but you still have to respond to it. So all of these events started engaging me amongst a group of people discussing what should be the slogans we, 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 uh, we create for this. What are the posters we're going to make? I would write speeches in the background for other people who would get on stage and deliver them. I'm the girl with that volunteer t-shirt arranging those chairs. I'm not the one sitting there and delivering the press conference. Right? That's the kind of reluctant citizen that I became. But in the process of doing that, what happened is that my mind, which was in this almost like hermetically sealed cover that said, you know, you shall solve engineering problems, you shall solve the, the problems that your company wants you to solve, was freed. My company would never let me create a slogan, would never let me, you know, write a company position on a product because that is the job of marketing team or that is the job of some other team. Each of us have their assigned spots and within those spots we can innovate, but we have very assigned spots. And the beauty of being in, the public, in, in a public space, whether it is citizen activism or politics, is that it is voluntary. You do what you can do. And there are no restrictions as to where you can contribute. You can try your hand at so many different things. And it was almost like a renaissance for me, that I could do all of these fun things. So at some point in this journey, I also started writing. Every one of us that lives in India cannot escape the fact that there is an India that lives very differently than us. Every traffic light that we stop at and we see a pregnant woman with a child begging, every station that you go to or a market where you see disabled people being exploited, you cannot ignore that. But we, we do, we look at it, we feel the pain, and then we look away, and then we grant those three boons when the time comes, during a birthday, during a certain you know, uh, spe special occasion. But what happened to all these repressed feelings is that it started coming out through articles. If I could write a speech, if I could compose a press release, I could certainly write articles. And I started to write about things. I started to write about states' rights, about federalism, about um, autonomy, about citizenship, about politics, politics in Delhi and Karnataka and Andhra and everywhere, about gender issues. Once you start writing, you can't stop it. And this became a medium for me to channel my repressed feelings, my pain, and my anger at the system. This morning, I opened the papers. Every one of you that opened the papers saw two gruesome acts of rape. Yes, every one of you saw it. You felt pain, you felt anger. If you're a decent human being, you felt it. Tomorrow morning, when you open the paper, you may see it again. And you would have done nothing in 24 hours. But it doesn't go away. It's there inside. And what citizenship allows you to do that I realized after having been dragged in there, kicking and screaming, that it allows you to channelize that and provides a way for you to release it in a very meaningful fashion, small but meaningful fashion. So I found myself going from reluctant citizen to putting my name on articles to sitting in the front during a, 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 a press meet leading a protest. So I had transitioned from looking at myself as someone who's only a family member, someone who cares about myself and my aspirations, and next my family and their well-being, to someone who actually thought that I have a role in society. And at that point, what I realized is that those that are unaffected those that are not outra outraging, 
If we provide a platform for them to easily come in, the way I was provided a platform as a reluctant citizen initially to take a few tentative steps, there are so many more of us that feel that, that may be willing to take those steps. So if we lower the barrier to access for citizenship, a lot more people may participate. And even as we were doing these experiments with politics and civic issues, the Karnataka government actually sent a blessing in disguise. And that was called, in 2016, the steel flyover. You've seen Bilbao, and you've seen Shivpuri, but you ain't seen nothing yet till you see Bangalore. So, in 2016, the Karnataka government announced this grand steel flyover for initially at 1,300 crores for about 6.5 kilometers, 6.7 kilometers. You do the math, it comes to about 200 crores per kilometer to build a flyover. And we realized you could actually gild it with gold, right? It could be a gold flyover. And the beauty was it was running to the airport, right? So that cars could go six minutes faster. And who goes in cars except VIPs? It's the same gods and goddesses in our avatars granting boons as we go to the airport. And we were going to spend 1,300 crores of public money on this. So you could, we could feel the palpable outrage in the citizenry. It manifested in terms of social media outrage, in terms of a change.org petition that Srinivas started, my co-conspirator with Citizens for Bengaluru, that received tens of thousands of um, you know, endorsements overnight. And so we got together and we started uh, to formulate the idea of a protest. For October 16th, barely nine days prior to that, for the first time, we met a bunch of us and said, you know, we should plan a protest. Nine days later, what we had thought originally, we'd get about 3,000 people. If we are lucky, 1,500 people, hopefully, we ended up with 10,000 people on the street. How many of you were there? Anyone there at the street? For There you go. It was 10,000 gods and goddesses, well-to-do people, middle class coming out and saying, I have a role in society. You're not going to take my agency away in spending my money. And what it taught us, they sustained and sustained while the government dismissed us initially and said, you guys are, you know, weekend warriors. You guys are the IT crowd. You'll outrage a little bit more on social media and then you'll disappear. While it was easy to try to put us down, we stuck because the volunteers stuck, people stuck. And we started talking about alternates like public transport, about the train, about the bus. And we started ran, running campaigns around mass transit with thousands of people getting on a train and going from Whitefield to Cantonment, Cantonment to Whitefield. The Whitefield station had never seen so many people before. With hundreds of people getting on a bus, with celebrities joining us, all spontaneously. And this is not an NGO, this is just a citizen's movement. And what this taught was that if you provide a platform and there is public out, there is so much public outrage against so many things that are repressed. And if you time it right, like when the steel flyover was announced, there is a lot that citizens can get together and accomplish. And I want to actually spend a minute talking to you about one specific thing we accomplished other than getting the steel flyover canceled. Because we are here talking about systems for law and justice, I feel this is particularly relevant. In the 74th Amendment to the Constitution in 1993, it was established that urban governance, municipalities and cities, would be governed by a corporation with elected corporators. Constituencies would be divided into wards. Each ward would have a corporator. And in addition, that corporator would be assisted by what is called a ward committee per ward. The ward committee is a group of citizens, people like you and me, not elected. The ward committee includes women, includes SESTs, includes resident welfare associations. It includes ordinary people who are residing in the ward because we know best what our ward needs. And ward is just your locality. This is The 74th Amendment is a manifestation of Swaraj, plain and simple. We must govern our own wards. And we are supposed to, the ward committee is supposed to work with the corporator to bring forth the issues of the ward. There are five streets with missing street lights. Which one should get prioritized first? What are the, what are the problems in the ward so that budgeting can happen bottom up? 
These are the kinds of things a ward committee is supposed to work with the corporator on, on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. And citizens, instead of having just one corporator to go to, you have now 10 other people just like you and me that are from your own apartment complex or you know, from your own uh, slum area and you know them. So you can easily go to them and talk to them about your issues. Now this is in the law. That's the beauty of India. We have all the laws. Somebody said yesterday that we have all the laws we need and more. But there were no what committees in Bangalore or maybe there were one or two. 25 years into that, there were still no what committees. We got lucky in 2017 due to a, so a solid waste management issue, a separate issue. The High Court of Karnataka decreed to the BBMP, which is the corporation of Bangalore, that thou shall form what committees and gave them a deadline by which they had to form what committees. So we thought timing, right? This is the time to get on the straight. And we said, we asked citizens across Bangalore to nominate people they know to the what committees. You know she's an active citizen, nominate her to the what committee. And we got thousands of nominations, which we then submitted to the BBMP so that they could get into ward committees. The people you want in the ward committees are active citizens. But when the ward committees got announced, guess who were in them? We got two in the ward committees. The rest were all chelas of the corporators. The corporators' brother-in-law, the female corporators, male husband, so on and so forth. The Sarpanch Patis made it in. Active citizens didn't. So we said, yet another reason to protest. We're going to do a mass RTI filing. And if you look at the picture at the bottom, that's the crowded corridor of the corporation, of the BBMP, where 200 of us showed up and decided to file RTIs demanding how did you appoint ward committees when no active citizens are missing, uh, no active citizens are on it. We didn't go to court to say the 74th Amendment is not implemented. We didn't go back to court saying your own order is being subverted. But we got people to lobby this. We got people to protest this. We got people to demand this. We basically tried to channel public outrage to say, look at how due process is being subverted. By the end of all of that, a whole year of such campaigns, there was a new mayor and commissioner. Her term had, uh, his term has expired. We got a new mayor, Gangambike. And because of all these campaigns and the publicity that it generated, when we went and petitioned them and said, look, this is what is happening. We need ward committees to meet monthly so that people can actually air their issues. She, they both passed an order in December 2018. We got a government order. This is a policy change mandating that ward committees shall meet monthly every Saturday at 11 a.m. in Bangalore. So that order stands right now. And as a result, we have now more than 800 ward committee meetings that have happened in the past seven or so months, hitherto, you know, none. You clapped on cue, I'm very glad about that. But the thing is, the journey is not over, right? There is a cultural change that needs to happen. We're not quite there yet because citizens themselves are unaware of ward committees unaware of the power of what committees, right? And then you have all the subversion in the process with the chela sitting in the what committee, right? So this is a journey. And this was a great stop in the journey that made me realize that in descending from being a goddess to a reluctant citizen to a conscious citizen and moving along this continuum, if we deliberately create and time a, a platform which allows everyone who's interested in the issue to join, reduce that barrier of entry, there are many, many, many more people sitting here that would gladly contribute. If I told them, if we created a platform that said, all are welcome, you don't have to align with me on whether Article 370 should be abrogated or not. You don't have to align with me whether death penalty should be awarded to rapists. But can you and I agree that what committees should meet monthly. If we can scope things with a very simple, clear demand and have a platform that is open to everybody, volunteer-led, no bureaucracy, not an NGO, no head office, you know, no kind of bank account, and people who want to contribute three hours can come in, people who want to stay with us through a campaign can come in, all those volunteers that you saw that have stayed with us through this journey are also welcome. And it's sort of a leaderless movement in that sense. That got me thinking that when the Lok Sabha elections were declared, we knew that there is a repressed 
real anger, latent anger under the surface that's bubbling about the fact that women are 50% of the population, 50% of the voters. In fact, in many, many states this time, the percentage of women voting exceeded the percentage of men voting, exceeded for the first time in the history of India. And yet 90% of everything, everything from my electricity board to my water supply, to my police, to my judiciary, and we are here for that, to my parliament, to my assembly, to my media, is run by men. You have not engaged the talent of 50% of the population in governing a democracy, a republic where we are supreme. And this 50% has untapped talent, which hasn't been engaged. In fact, the even more shocking thing is this. If you added up every single woman who has been elected to parliament since 1952, take every single woman elected to parliament since 1952, add it up, you cannot fill a single parliament in this country. You won't fill the parliament. That is how shocking things are. When we said just before the Lok Sabha elections, if we start a citizens movement to demand more women in parliament, could we make our voices heard? Could we make this issue front and center? And so Shakti was born, a pan-India movement where we started campaigning for the six months between December, December 6th, the anniversary is coming up, between December 6th and when the Lok Sabha elections got over, we ran a series of campaigns. And very much like Citizens for Bengaluru, we had women from across, men and women from across, right-thinking men and women from across India join us. We had farmers, and when I say farmers, I mean women. We had farmers from Maharashtra. We had, you know, Dalit women. We had uh, tribal women. We had Northeast Solidarity Forum. We had rape survivors. And we campaigned against the election commission to say, when you're chartered to make sure that the political parties that you register have to function democratically, how do you allow them not even to field women candidates? How do you allow them to stand only male candidates? 8% of candidates across this country are women. 92% of the tickets, election tickets, go to men. If you can't even stand for the race, if you can't even run the race, how do you win the race? At the end of all of this, what do we have to show for it? And this is six months of sustained campaigning. We have a long way to go again. We have 78 women in the Lok Sabha, unprecedented like never before. And this is not Shakti's work. This is the work of so many people. This is not only Shakti's work. It's more than ever before. And we know 78 out of 2, 543 is 14%, too few. So I want to leave you with this thought. Martin Luther King once said that the arc of moral universe may be long, but it bends, inevitably bends towards justice. I want, you to leave, I want to leave you with Sarah Silverman, the American stand-up comic. It does not naturally bend towards justice. We must bend it. Especially in India. We have one-fifth one -fifth the size of government that America has for its population. One-fifth. There is no way in hell a government can govern India without citizen intervention. I leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.